Cool. We're live. Um, oh, hey, Sylvia. I see you in the chat there. Awesome. Um, hey, y'all. Thanks for joining. Super excited to chat with Tara today. Uh, I'm going to do a little intro about this event and a preamble, and then we're going to get right into the content. Um, first and foremost, we want uh, everyone here to be engaged. Uh, so if you have questions, I see there's already a little chat from Sylvia in the chat box. Let us know if you have questions throughout this experience. Um, my goal is for you to get anything that's on your mind answered. If we don't answer it right during the discussion, we might hold it to the end and ask it then. Um, but awesome uh, to see a couple people engaged. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Jeremy. Uh, I am on the practice team and I get the pleasure of talking to coaches all over the world in all sorts of different verticals. My goal today is to bring a point of view uh, of a coach and not going to grill Tara, but we're going to ask her some questions that we can talk about. And if I miss something, let me know. Um, so throw me a little bit in the chat. Let us know where you're watching from. See, we have Lancaster, PA. I'm actually in Ann Arbor, Michigan today. Um, and I'm going to let Tara introduce herself because she knows herself so well. And then we're going to get into it. Great. Uh, hi, I'm Tara Teich. I am uh, dialing in from San Francisco, California. Uh, I have 20 years experience as a software engineer and an engineering manager, and I made the shift earlier this year to full-time coaching. Uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Totally. Okay. So that actually is like really good for where we're going to start. Um, let's talk about that transition because I think a lot of people go from uh, professional corporate world to, to pivoting and coaching. So maybe just like briefly add some color and some context to like, where was your head at? Why did you think about making the, the pivot to coaching? Um, and what did you consider when you were making that transition? Yeah. So um, I think I think it mirrored my decision to move from individual contributor to manager and then manager to coach, actually, which was um, having an impact on those people around me and making things better and improving their quality of work and life. Um, so that was why I went into be, being a manager from being an IC. Um, and one of the things I saw as a manager was man being a software engineering manager is much more than people managing. Um, there's, uh, I mean, I was working at uh, Apple as a manager and then at Stripe, and I was doing a huge amount of product focused development, which I liked. Um, mm -hmm. But like, you know, there's kind of two halves to that, right? So there's like working with the organization as a whole and figuring out where we should be going and um, and then maybe some less pleasant kind of corporate politics elements. And I found that the part that I I was was most rewarding was the mentorship and coaching that I was doing for the people on my team. Um, mm. And that was the most pride of purpose that I found was when people told me about the impact that I had on improving their trajectory of their career. Mm. And so I wanted that to be my 100% focus. So um, I, uh, I took a break, uh, went through, someone said corporate politics, no way, yeah. <laughs> uh, I took a break, uh, did some coach training, um, spoke to coaches I knew, and then just decided, I'm gonna just say it, I'm gonna say it out loud, I'm a full-time coach, and, and here we are today. That's awesome. I think that, um, because we talked to a lot of coaches, there's definitely this feeling of imposter syndrome uh, am I a coach? When do I call myself a coach? I, I talked to someone who said, I didn't call myself a coach for the first year and a half. And so, and that's okay. I mean, you obviously it's, there's a comfort, but I think one of the things that, uh, on your journey that was really helpful for you, it sounds like is the education piece. Yeah. Um, so I went and did Coactive's um, five course training program. And one of the things that's interesting about that is they actually moved entirely online um, during the pandemic um, and it's global. So you do three or five day workshops that you can choose how many hours a day, essentially. Wow. And we have a really international audience. So hello. Um, and I took the first class um, in 2021 yeah. and I loved it. And um, I just kind of wanted to see what it was about because I knew people that just left um, uh, tech and were just like, I'm a coach, right? They just went out and they just were, had sure. the, and, and I will say, I don't think I had imposter syndrome around being a coach, but I would not have been as good a coach as I am now without the training because okay. there are things that you do as a manager that you shouldn't do as a coach, which okay. is give a lot of advice. Um, mm -hmm. So that would, I'd say, be one of the bigger ones. 
Yeah. And when you were thinking about where you wanted to get your education, mm -hmm. why, like why coactive? How did you land there? How did that, how did your decision kind of come to, to that conclusion? I spoke to other coaches I knew. And I think one of the things is I wanted like I, I love class. I love like, you know, and there's lots of books you can read and there's lots of like single workshops you can take. But I like that Coactive had a curriculum um, mm. that you could kind of go through and 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 it would teach you a whole holistic approach. And I will say there are many things about um, Coactive's approach that don't resonate with me and I, I leave them behind. But okay. I took something from every class I took and like I kept going because I knew I was going to learn something. Um, as opposed to like one three-day workshop, I got 104 hours, <laughs> yeah. um, which also opens your door if you do want to get certified. It, it is the the it is in the classroom curriculum meets mm. that need. Yeah, when you think about things that you uh, like when you're going through education, figuring out your certification, did you have like a preconceived point of view on like what you would have? as part of the outcome of that? Like, did you expect to leave with any cer certain tools or uh, a stamp of approval or like a badge or, or something on your website? Like, what, did you have any like thing that you were going to that certification with the expectation of, if that makes sense? Um, it makes sense. I think yeah. not. I think that um, I didn't, I actually didn't know. <laughs> so to be frank, I took a pause from everything during the pandemic and I didn't know what was next in my life. Got it. And I had, I think, originally signed up for coach training because I had done, um, Stripe had provided us with coaches. Um, okay. And I had done like a couple of little how to be a better manager. Here's some coach training tools and tips, like learning the grow model. Um, and so I was like, you know, let's let's sign up and see what it's about. And I don't think I thought I would go out and be a full time coach. I thought maybe on the side, maybe who knows, maybe it's just to make, maybe it's to bring it in house. I actually did a stint as a VP of engineering at a startup. I was like, maybe it's something that would help there. Mm. And it's only when I um, took like this pause, I, 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 I spent some time with family. I took a pause. I reconnected with what was really important to me that I came to the conclusion that this was my full-time thing. So I didn't have expectations about the class because I didn't have expectations about what came next in my life at all. Mm, got it. So looking back on your education, now you kind of recently kind of finished or concluded. Yeah. Um, what, are, what are a few things that you've retained really well? Things that like stick out about your experience that um, you expect to implement in your practice and, and that really stuck with you? Yeah, I think the thing from fundamentals is around like they talk about three levels of listening. Um, so level one listening, you're basically just hearing like on the surface and thinking about what you're going to say next. Mm. Um, like level two, you're maybe taking in more elements and level three, you're hearing the unsaid. Um, so they talk a lot about intuition in coactive. Um, and I think there's something intensely scary about just like saying, and then, and there's a couple other skills around that, around like blurting out things you think might be true and mm -hmm. letting go of ideas that don't match with what the client says. So a lot of that stuff where you just kind of like, I think you might be saying this and they might go, nope, not at all. And then you're like, okay. And you move on like that skill. And then also the skill yeah. that a lot of times it works, um, which it sounds like black magic, but you're like, I feel like you might mean this and and they feel so seen so the power to see people and hear people um mm -hmm. and 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 see how effective that is a change in and of itself i think that was like the grounding of everything do you uh in your corporate job do you ever have experience where like you maybe even did that unintentionally and um then have since heard it as a as a strategy and a tool and then naturally started to do it? Or is this like totally brand new, came from, from the certification and now this is you know part of your, your tool set? I think you're right in that I was already doing a lot of it, at least in my manager, my mm -hmm. one-on-ones. Uh, I think that's what makes a good manager is that really active listening and having people be seen um, and hearing what they're really trying to say to you. Um, and then psychological safety, I think, is the other really big thing um, around being a manager and obviously being having an effective coaching relationship. Um, but, and then there are other more concrete tools that I don't think I had around, um, 
getting people out of their perspective, you know, make like um, treating things as concrete elements outside themselves for them to see them and be like, like um, I did a practice recently with someone where, where we made a decision point she had be two um, characters in, a, in two different stories. And she realized, I don't like that person. And that made that story like clearly the wrong decision for her. Um, so things like that, I never would have tried. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. So let's talk about your coaching practice today. I'm just going to look mm -hmm. at my questions. When you think about, you know, designing an experience for your clients, what, what do you think about? How have you kind of come to that? Because you're kind of newly on your journey. You're kind of still ramping up. What do you want your experience to be for your clients in making, you know, that pivot and looking at what you've done in the past and your experience in the, in the corporate world and, you know, balancing the education that you've just gotten? What do you want to design for your clients in, in delivering to them? Yeah. One of the things that brings people to me is my experience. And so there are coach, you know, some people will tell you that a good coach never interjects their opinion. And, mm. you know, they're, they're not they're you know, anyone could coach anyone. Mm. And I think that that is true in the abstract, but people come to me because I have the experience and that gives. Yeah. And so when people, when I onboard people, I make it really clear. I'm like, look, I wear three hats in our relationship. One is as a coach and a coach is someone who helps you find the solutions to your own problems. You know, I ask illuminating questions and you provide the answers, but at the same time, I also have personal experience. So occasionally I'm gonna tell you, I'm changing my hat right now. Do you wanna hear my opinion on something? And I might give advice. I, advice is actually not, I think the thing I do that's most validating is actually saying when someone is in a negative place, like feeling imposter syndrome or like they can't do something, validating their experience by saying, I was there too. And here's a scenario where I also struggle with the same problem. And I don't think it's so much like me telling them the, the, the success that I had and how I got out of it, but, but, um, but sharing that I know where they're at and they're not alone, which is actually still part of that coaching part of being seen. Um, mm -hmm. And then sometimes I will give advice. <laughs> and I think that's when they're getting into a really tactical place and they're like, I don't know what to do. And we're doing, we've gone through all the coaching tools and they're just like stuck. And I'm like, okay, let's just make some lists and like throw ideas out. And I might see those mm -hmm. ideas. I might give some of them to start. And sometimes they take my ideas and they use them, but I, that's, you know, that's not where we ultimately want to be long-term, but I think that's part of it. How much would you say is a balance of, like the coaching hat the men the, and the mentorship kind of hat or or where you're offering advice like is there ever, ever cases where clients are like they actually say i i want to figure this out on my own I, I don't want the advice or i don't want that mentorship no one's ever said that but i've seen it not land and so that's been actually my journey like i had a client who's who's been with me since i started in may and when I worked with them, sometimes I would, I was trying to find that balance and maybe it was like 50, 50 at the beginning. That was way wow. too much, yeah. way too much. Um, and that was like 10% of me, like yeah. if that, um, and, and like I said, I think I learned that it's not providing solutions, but pro providing camaraderie. Um, and I think the other part that actually I want to point about where my expertise is useful is, is, is quickly creating a common language and grounding. So I know what they're talking about when they're talking about their OKRs or their, you know, planning yeah. cycle or their up levels or their pips. And I know exactly the problems they're talking about and they don't have to explain it. So I think yeah. that's another place where it's just helpful as a grounding. What were some of the signals for you? Uh, if you look back on that relationship to, to adjust your balance of like 50, 50 to mm -hmm. maybe 90, 10, like uh, what, what, what were the cues? How did you figure out that it wasn't working or you needed to, to adjust? Well, you know, you're having a conversation um, yeah. and your client has a certain level of engagement and ah, my ideas. Mm, eh. And like, then yeah. I say something and they're kind of like, Hmm, you know, like the energy drops <laughs> and yeah. you're like, Oh, that was, that was, I took him out of his head into like, into my space. Like I, I, okay. I like shoved him out of his thinking place and that, became pretty clear just from the reaction. Yeah, I see. Do you have a process for yourself that you reflect on your own coaching sessions to see 
uh, how you operate in a certain way or how that conversation went? Like, do you have an internal retro or a process that you use for yourself to review that stuff? No, but that sounds awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I think well, um, I'm a very introspective person in general. Um, in a lot of my sessions, I take copious notes by hand, which I don't do anything with. It's just part of my process of understanding what's going on. Um, and I think that that's like part of just acknowledging that. And and I think like everyone, like your failures ring out better than your successes. And so I just remember those moments where I'm like, oh, that didn't yeah. work. And it just, yeah. I think yeah. the whole, there the whole some... time I'm self-reflective. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh, for sure. We had a, um, a conversation with Josh uh, Dietrich, um, mm -hmm. I want to say maybe a month ago at this point. Um, and one of the tools that he has for himself to improve his own practice is uh, he has like a retro that he does on a like a quarterly basis where he looks back at um, some of the things that he did well and some of the things that he didn't do so well. Um, and there's a, a, an idea of like documentation there that he like really reflects on how he can improve. And I just thought that was really interesting because when you're running a solopreneurship business, um, you're not reporting to uh, a boss or a board or any leadership group like you are your own boss. And so to institute something like that, I think, um, is really cool. I want to pull in a question from Matthew um, here. Mm -hmm. You find your tendency for taking notes by hand ever becomes distracting in the coaching process. Um, so for one, I'll say taking notes by hand is way better than taking them on the computer mm. uh, from a distraction standpoint, because um, the blank page is not distracting, unlike you're on your computer. And also I have a mechanical keyboard, so it's really loud. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't sometimes like I had a session yesterday with someone and I didn't take a single note because no. one, we didn't need it. We were going over a document mm. and two, like it was about connection. Yeah. And just like, I needed to be making eye contact. Yeah. Do you think that, um, in terms of how, like from a, from a coach to client relationship perspective, like, do you share deliverables after sessions with your clients or is there not really like that expectation? And your clients just take their own notes if they need to. Um, sorry, I'm reading people's comments. Uh, <laughs> no one's told me if the top of my head is visible, but um, um, I do. It depends on the client, actually. Like I have one client who's very like material oriented and, and they are doing all of that. Right. They're like, OK, what's my homework? What am I doing? Like, I like to give people something to focus on that week. And mm -hmm. that client likes to call it homework. Um, and another client, like. I'm pushing them and challenging them, and I think they they want that, but um, they'll, they'll happily forget some of it. So I make sure to send like you know, just a couple sentences after the session to say, here's what the focus is for this week. You know, let's check it in. Yeah, I like that. Victor, Victor likes that as well. That's that's great. Um, that actually brings up a good point. We talked about the idea of designing an experience for your clients. Do you tend to have a curriculum or do you believe that you should have a curriculum that you're following a path along to help them through like a process? Or is it very like client by client based where, um, you know, in your discovery process or at the onboarding process, you're really, um, uncovering their needs and then really just kind of focusing on on what it is they need versus a prescribed like curriculum that they have to follow. Yeah, uh, I do not have a prescribed curriculum. So a coach that I had who I learned a lot from uh, uh, Lucy, I can't say her last name, Gio Gordis, I think is the way you say it. Um, we had a great conversation when I got started and she gave me the framework that I use to this day, which is mm. you set uh, you talk, you set basically initial goals for your coaching relationship. So the mm. first session after we kind of establish um, how we want to work together and communication norms and what our boundaries are, we'll, we'll talk about, it's basically got uh, three columns. So it's like, where are you now? Like what? Okay. So uh, where are you now? Where do you want to be? What's your goal? So like summing it mm. up in a, in a goal. Or how do you get there? Yeah, how do you get, how will you know when you've gotten there? That's what the last one is. How will you know when you got there? And so we we do a brainstorm on that and basically establish goals for our working relationship. And I usually like to say, like, let's set three month goals, especially for an initial engagement to sort of say, 
where will, do you want to be in three months? I want our collaboration to be productive. And it's not about just, um, it's about getting somewhere for you and you learning to achieve some goal or new skills or something like that. And I want to make sure that at the end of these three months, you can look back and know that you made progress. And that's where um, I really like the framework because you, when you look at the word, the where, where was I? And, and a lot of times those are um, a kind of like, I am overwhelmed by work. I am, you know, not sleeping. I'm, I'm just like <laughs> things that happened to me in the past. Right. Yeah. And then you're like, where do you want to be? I want to find balance between work and play. I want to, you mm -hmm. know, no, but we do in the present tense. I have balance between work and play. So then as you look back later and you look at those initial words, hopefully they feel foreign. You're like, I'm not there anymore. I've journeyed. So and, and, and how do we get there? That's up to the client. Maybe we're going to do a values exploration. Maybe we're going to talk about strategies for managing your time. Like maybe whatever it is um, that comes from the client. That's great. So when you are kind of designing your services, at least on like the business side of the business end of that idea, uh, it sounds like a three month engagement. I don't know if you call it, do you call it a package? Is it, is it a retainer model? Just on the tactical side, how do you design like the biz ops piece of that. Yeah, I'm still experimenting with that. Right now, um, I don't want to lock anyone in. Yeah. So I feel like if you want to work with me, you want to work with me. Um, yeah. So I basically do four week packages um, okay. at a time. I feel like, yeah. you know, you need that to at least know if it's working. But at the same time, like if after a month of working with me, you're like, this isn't working out, I'm not gonna be like, well, you paid me. So <laughs> keep coming. Like, it just doesn't feel good to me. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, as far as like the, like kind of the, the next layer of that, and this is, there's a question in here from Chris and Krista. I also have my own question, but when you blend like your expertise into your coaching, um, whether it's in tech, whether it's in different fields, um, how, how, how does that work? Like really, because you talked about like being able to speak the same language. I think we, I love to expand on that because that's really important where, you don't have to like have someone explain the corporate structure of their business or how their team judges metrics and success. Um, but how do you make sure that you're uh, kind of remaining at that level of engagement just relative to like your expertise and the world that they live in as well? Um, so are you asking if I'm still brushing up on my sort of and yeah, you know, like, yeah, like how, how do you how do you still like stay engaged? Because your expertise, obviously, and like your experience in a, in a applying that to the clients that you work with, what does it mean to do that? You talked about speaking the same language as the client. Are there other things that that you lean on where your expertise, in addition to the commonality of the way the clients speak to you? Yeah, I think so. Here's one thing that I learned as a manager. Um, you don't need to be an expert in the thing you're managing. And that's true for coaching too. Um, mm. And so I, um, I was, I worked on iOS. I was an iOS software developer for a long time. Yeah. And then when I joined Stripe, I was managing iOS and Android. And I was like, wow, oh, it's an Android. Yeah. I don't know anything about it. Um, but I, it was still com com comfortable. But after two years of doing that, I went and I managed a team that was, um, in the risk department building web-based tools for fraud investigations. And I knew zero about the technology stack we were using mm -hmm. um, or about like the domain we were in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say, I just brought my curiosity. Um, and I think that applies um, to being a manager and it applies to being a coach. So you don't need to be a domain expert, but mm -hmm. that skill of being comfortable with the unknown um, I'd say I bring that, that sort of sense of, I might not understand everything you're saying, but I just need to get at like, one of the skills I built as a manager was asking the right questions. Yeah. And that's just key to being a coach. So I don't need to understand, I don't need to be able to make a decision. I need to ask the questions that help you make the decision. Um, and that's something I learned as a manager. That's really awesome. Uh, that's really awesome. Even for me internally, I'm curious about how you know when the questions you've asked are the right questions. Maybe there was some trial and error there, but like, how do you know when you're asking the right questions? Is there something, is it, is it like cues from the recipient? Is it like how they feel? How do you know? 
you'd be surprised how many times people say, that's a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that happens a lot. Um, but I would say it's when they don't have a quick answer. Mm. Um, um, or, you know, when it makes them stop and actually change their perspective, forces them to actually think that's mm. a good question. Yeah, because they don't just have the answer off the hip or, you know, a quick response. Got you. Because that's a lot of coaching is about changing how people's perspective on like getting them out of a rut um, and into new a new perspective on achieving their goals. And if they're just answering by rote, then they're not doing that. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, from Sylvia, kind of related, but do you leverage your own vulnerability to build rapport with clients? Is there is there a component of that? I would say yes. I think that's that's something that's come up in my practice sessions in classes as well as just in general. Um, as a manager, that was I'm I'm very I don't know if raw is the right word, but I'm very authentic. I bring my myself. I am yeah. I don't hide and I'm willing to talk about my failures, mm. um, and my setbacks and how and and that inspires trust because yeah. I'm trusting them. Um yeah. How Time, time frame wise, like I'm sure it's important to do that from the get go and you don't just build rapport like immediately. It takes time to, to develop that in that relationship. Um, do you have like a, a, like a path that you follow in each client you work with or is it very just like client specific in what you do to build rapport, but you kind of lean on certain parts of, of your expertise and your personality and who you are to build that that special connection with a client? Um, I would say if I were planning it, it wouldn't be authentic. Okay. Um, so yeah. I do not plan it. I mean, I mentioned this in the email, I do a lot of improv. Yeah. And so, um, and which actually has a lot of commonalities about being in the moment. Okay. Um, and responding to what is offered to you. Um, so, um, you know, you're not thinking about what you're going to say next because you don't know what the person opposite you is going to say. So I think it's the same for like, I can't engineer vulnerability. Mm -hmm. All I can do is like be in the moment and be really present and then offer up my from the heart response and have them see that I'm there with them. I love that. To you, what does it mean to be in the moment? I know that's kind of meta, but like, what does it mean to you to be in the moment? You're not thinking about other stuff. You're not like, you know, looking out the window. You're hearing what they're saying and you're not just hearing what they're saying. You're observing them and you're trying to figure out, you know, where they are right now um, and 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 like um, echo them in that moment and feel what, what they need. Um, it's funny because like I wouldn't have thought of myself as like sort of touchy feely woo woo. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and the CTI training is very much that. And I'm like, I'm not touchy feeling, but I think I've come out. It's like rubbed off on mm. me a little where I'm like, there is a certain energy and a certain, like just feeling the presence, even on zoom that you yeah. can do. Um, you want to, to notice like, I mean, you're probably noticing like micro expressions and stuff, but we're going to call it the energy. I like, I mean, that's, that's kind of what energy is, right. Is like you, how you feel. So do you think that that's, that is a skill that you learned in your education and, maybe not something you had pre in your like corporate corporate experience or um maybe there was a there's a combination of what you had then what you learned and how those two things got married together um but how did you like attain that skill um that's definitely something i built over a long time yeah um, the me of my 20s did not have it um I'm in my forties now. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, I would say life, life will get you there if you pay attention. Um, and I think the training made me more cognizant of the skill, uh, mm. like naming it for what it is, but being an empathetic and present listener is kind of like my, my brand. No, it's like who I am as a person. Yeah. Well, no, that, I mean, that's, it, that's one of the questions I had on my list for you is when you talk about, you know, delivering your what experience you want your clients to have but also like when you talk about what your one of your differentiators for your coaching business i'm curious how you see that as something that is you know special and unique to you i 
you know, I've only had like two or three people coach me. So it's hard to say, you know, what my differentiator is on that front. I think the fact that I have extensive high level engineering and product leadership experience. Mm -hmm. So I know, uh, I know what's going on there. And I think that's my differentiator. I really love, and I love working with engineers, engineering managers, product managers, because I get it. (laughs) Um, and so, uh, and there's just like one, there's a resonance for me and two, I do miss it a little. And so getting to vicariously hear about what they're building and, you know, help yeah. them build it. Like I'm still helping build cool products. Yeah. yeah. Helping the people. For sure. For sure. Indirectly. Um, let's talk about like the, like the tactical side of like actually standing up and like launching your business. Um, cause I think it's always really interesting to hear uh the step when you are at the early stage and what you're going through and and i think there's a lot always to learn from that this one actually from uh kristen though kristen krista how have you found your clients in your field of expertise and we kind of talked a little bit about um lead gen but but where just where did you start like what was kind of the first thing that you did to take some of those steps I put up a website. So, um, because first thing I did was like tell some people I'm thinking I'm going to become a coach and they're like, Oh, can, do you have something I can point people to? So they know what you're Mm -hmm. about. And so then I was like, Oh, I need a professional website. And then I got it all in my head and then I got some coaching on it. And I was like, you know, just put something up. So I went to Squarespace. I, you know, I, I was like, what should a company be called? Whatever. It's my last name, coaching, taishcoaching.com. Right. Mm -hmm. Just be simple. Don't try and don't try and make everything perfect. You just need a landing page to send to people who are interested in, in seeing that you are a coach and you have a page and it says something about you and they know how to book an appointment. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did that. I just put up a website um, and at first I just use um, I think I just use Calendly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was just like book a meeting um, and then yes, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Yeah. Well said. Um, Um, and I, um, and then I just went on LinkedIn and I was like, I just like quietly changed my job title. Um, and I didn't know that I got pushed out to my network because I got all these people being like, Oh, this is so great. And I got someone reaching out being like, Oh, wow, you're a coach now. Will you coach me? Okay. Um, so yeah, so I got like, I got lucky. I would say, and then my first client, like I just fell upon them. I wasn't even ready to think about pricing. You know, I was like billing anything. I I wasn't there yet. And, uh, and then I had a a client hasn't all been that easy, but that first one was, I mean, sometimes it's great. Just when the first one is like that simple and it kind of gives you a little bit of that flywheel and that momentum. That's awesome. What was your feeling? Like what, what was in your head? Like, did you like, was it like a, Oh shit moment? Was it a, like you're thinking about the experience you want to deliver. Like what what was kind of next for you in when that happened? What what yeah. did you do next and think about next? I didn't know what you did in the first session. Like even though the training I had was like, oh, you have to design your alliance and talk about. But I was like, what do I actually do? Yeah. <laughs> and that's when I reached out to Lucy and and was like, what do I do in the first session? Um, and she gave me a framework. Sorry, I have a dog and she's whining and I'm hoping yeah. she just calm down. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> um, so, uh, so she gave me that framework mm-hmm. and of the, the sort of like setting goals and everything. And I was like, that's great. And it's not heavyweight because I'm not heavy. Like a, I'm not a big like, like there's a lot of tools. I actually had a coach who was a career coach and we did lots of like assessments and all that stuff. Yeah. And it was interesting and useful at the time. That was when I was trying to decide what was next before I decided to be a coach. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I'm like, but that's not what I want to do. Um, I, I want to just kind of like be there and do whatever the client needs and not have yeah. a plan. Yeah. Um, which is it's hard, hard when you don't have a plan to start. Yeah. Thinking. No, I mean, it is, it is hard, but it's interesting because I think you, are almost like the situation itself forces you to think about it and deliver it pretty well. It's a um, situation where you need to perform and give the client something, right? Um, that's interesting. As far as like what you're thinking about for your own coaching practice and where you want to go, what do you want to accomplish in the next year or six months? 
um, as you're kind of ramping up on, on your journey in, in your business? Yeah. Um, I would say from a client acquisition standpoint, um, figuring that out. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I have, I have a couple of clients right now. Um, and I have, when I put, you know, I have discovery calls coming in from LinkedIn and things like that. And I think, um, I know I'm a great coach. I am not good at marketing. And so I'm not always, and I'm not always good at selling myself. So mm. what's that gap and how do I create an authentic understanding of what I'm going to be, um, what we will be together? Um, because yeah. I think once that is established, then it's great. And I, you know, I, I just, yeah, like the session I had yesterday, I just felt so like proud of what we accomplished together. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, from a client acquisition standpoint, I'm mostly just using LinkedIn. Um, and uh, and that's a fun game. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, <laughs> as far as, uh, it's kind of a good point though. As far as learning and like making those steps in the next six months or next year, uh, where do you look to for like inspiration? Do you, is there any like outlets or channels or people or coaches that um, influence how you want to continue to grow? Yeah. Well, so I'm really lucky in that I have a fellow coach who we both used to work at Stripe and she went through CTI right before me. So Brittany's story is like my coach accountability partner. So mm -hmm. we meet up and we do um, uh, like we do go to a coffee shop and like, let's do marketing together. And like, actually we had a, we coached each other through setting our goals for next year um, this weekend and around what are our client, uh, our client goals? What are our, our financial goals? Yeah. Where do we want to be with our business and what do we want it to look like? And then, you know, holding each other accountable uh, on how to get there. So that's yeah. just been great having someone who understands and is at a similar place in building her business. Um, and also when I have those moments where I'm like, like a, like a client emailed me and asked me something and I was uh, that I just, I was kind of like, mm, I don't know if I should, you know, like, what do I do? And I could run it yeah. by her. Yeah. That's, that's great. That's really great. I will say uh, this came up in a, in a event we did with Heather Stewart uh, last week and a shameless plug to anyone else here who's watching. I recommend watching the video with Heather because the, the accountability partner was a thing that she brought up as one of the most useful tools to have as you're ramping up in your coaching business, and even if your coaching business is mature. And the reason is because as a solopreneur, you're by yourself sometimes, and it's easy to make a list and forget about it or make a list and you know move on to the next list that you make. And so having an accountability partner, big thumbs up. Uh, I think it's really awesome that you have one, Tara, because that's really cool. Um, is there any advice that you have for other coaches who are, you know, making the transition or, or in the early stages of going from like the corporate world uh, to launching a coaching business or, or things that you experience that, you know, you'd want to share and, and relay? Yeah, um, I think say you're a coach right away. Um, you are a coach um, and don't be afraid to charge what you're worth. Um, mm. Like uh, and and one more, which is know who your clients, what clients you want. So I think yeah. it can be easy to say, I just want clients and mm -hmm. take people on that aren't the clients you want. Okay. Um, and and I think that's a mistake. So um, build your business where you want it to be, not like just to have people, because otherwise you're not going to find it sustaining in a, like like uh, like fulfilling. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because um, I... We, we've taught there was actually a thread in our community about this. Do you start really broad and kind of figure out who you're a good fit for, who you provide value for, or do you start with a niche and you kind of focus around the niche, but um, maybe don't tie yourself to it necessarily? It sounds like because of your expertise, naturally, there's a really good fit for you to start in that niche. Is that is that correct? Yeah. And, and um, you know, I had discovery calls with people who were outside that niche and like, you know, it didn't, it, it was clear it wasn't going to work. Like I, okay. I'm not at a point where I want to be coaching entry-level engineers. Like that's, mm -hmm. it's not that I, I, you should, you should be where your value is, is unique. Yeah. Um, and my value is unique in being able to coach high level 
engine managers, leaders, technical leaders, because, you know, I can also translate well between um, engineers speak and corporate speak. And yeah. so I can kind of see where they might be stumbling. Yeah. Um, and so that's like a, a unique skill I have. So I want to lean into that and, and make sure that I'm using my my powers for good. No, my time wisely. Yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you for sure. Um, this is a question from Sylvia. Uh, do you feel a duty to serve? It's funny. That's like a conflict I have where um, I've been very active in um, women in engineering efforts um, and sort of supporting women. And it's like, do you make a decision to um you know strictly kind of give back um mm -hmm. and i think my ultimate decision on that was no because you need to coach the people in power to help them create the environment that is mm. the culture that you want to be for everyone um and that's actually ultimately the thing that I want is I want to create inclusive communities and I want to help people realize when what they're doing might be excluding others um, and um, create more empathy in the world. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, this one from Victor and feel free to, uh, oh, awesome. Thumbs up, Sylvia. Yeah. Uh, I feel bad for your pop in the background. I'm sorry. You hear her? No, it's not too bad. I'm just kidding. Um, okay. This one from this one from Victor. I'm curious. I'm curious if you're if you're comfortable, even if it's just a range, sharing the annual average income of your clients in the way you price your four week package or kind of your your services on a monthly basis. I don't ask my clients what their annual okay. income is, <laughs> um, but I will say most of them work at large and established tech companies. Mm -hmm. So you know, they do all right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so they, they make good money. Um, and I would say like my rate is as low as it will ever be. Yeah. Um, so I do do a, my first month I offer 50% off. So I do four weeks of 50% off because I just, I feel like once you try it, you'll get hooked. Yeah. Um, and I don't want money to be the barrier to yeah. establishing that first relationship. Um, and then, and, and that lets me hold firm to what I believe my hourly rate is, um, to say, this is my hourly rate. You're going to get four weeks at a 50% discount, but after that we go up. So it, it makes it easier for them to sign up and then stick with me. I like it. I think, I think something to be said about the, like offering a discount where you reduce the, the initial, like friction of, of money is, is really a good tactic, especially when you're starting and by discounting the, the total amount people can connect with the actual value the, the price of it but not actually pay for it so i i, I like that a lot yes. um this one from sally uh what tools do you use today i use practice um so i basically started using practice i i think i used calendly for like two weeks <laughs> and then as i started looking into it i was like oh i want something to do my calendar and kind of maintain my client roster and do my billing and etc and looked around and i found practice and uh, i've been on it and been happily providing feedback uh for several months <laughs> love feedback love feedback other Great. than that um i don't really use any tools sometimes i use notion for like checklists and things for myself um, and then just Gmail and Squarespace for my personal website, not my business website. I mean, yeah. Awesome. Um, let's see. Those are all the questions we have. Uh, any other last words or anything else to share as we kind of round things out? Um, someone asked about Lucy. I think her company is oh, called yeah. Elevate Leadership. Um, it's like G or it's like, it's like George, it's a, it's a Greek last name, George. I don't even know. But I think her company is called um, uh, Elevate Leadership. Um, I would type, but it would be loud. Um, so yeah. Um, I, I can post a link in the... Uh, okay, yeah. let me find her then. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, Elevate Leadership. It's Georgiadis. Um, awesome. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Sarah. 
Um, awesome. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, the recording will be shared after the session. We'll email to all people who have registered. So if you missed the beginning or you missed the end, you'll get a chance to watch the whole thing. Um, thanks a ton to everyone who engaged and, and participated. Tara, thank you so much for joining as well. Um, if anyone's also curious about practice, uh, let us know. Practice.do. We'd love to talk to you and show you around. And um, we'll see you guys out there. It was a blast. Um, and check out practice.do forward slash events for upcoming events as well. Have a great day. Uh, thanks, and thanks everyone. Bye now.